So let me just, uh, let me just read what's on the uh, board here. Uh, the William Weber Lecture in Medical Education, in honor of 50 years of the contribution and inspiration of the medical graduates of UBC. Dr. Weber spent most of his academic life at UBC in various aspects of education, primarily, of course, medical. And I want to emphasize a point or two that's already been made, it, made because of their characteristic of the man. He was an outstanding teacher. He was a mentor. He was a role model. He was a highly effective administrator and he was a diplomat and take all of those and we have a marvelous combination but even more interesting to me and I think so many who know knew him was the fact of his deep interest in individuals and he saw his colleagues and his students in these terms and expressed those interests carried those characteristics to all the people he met. Bill was a, Bill Weber was a valued friend. A strong basic science and clinical science base is one of the major keys in producing and maintaining a world-class medical system. And outstanding and excellent teachers stress that educational experiences that enhance both the professional and personal development of undergraduates and its trainees is good teaching. Thank you very much. We began this last year in the hopes that it would become an annual event in recognition of Dr. Weber's contribution of uh, medical education at the University of British Columbia. Little did we know when we began this and uh, were involved with this a year ago that uh, the William Weber Lecture in Medical Education and Dr. Weber's presence would be the first and the last. <clears throat> While we all share in his loss and in his premature death, uh, we will try to make this lecture something that sustain is sustainable and will keep the memory alive and continue to recognize his contribution. <coughs> Our good teachers, our good teachers, born or made. I think good teachers you can make. The great teachers, I think you're born. And I think you have to use a rather broad definition for born. It has to include genetic and intrauterine and early family life. Because those things, uh, there, there's a phrase in, in genetics these days that the environment sculpts genes. So I think the great teachers are born and can work in any of these types of milieu. I think you can take a person who doesn't have the gene and through excellent faculty development programs like Bay Fair Home provides here and others, uh, make them a good teacher. I don't think there is any evidence in what I've seen and showed some of you, some of to, to you, that there is any evidence that you can take a person who doesn't have that excellent gene and make them into a great teacher. And it takes about, by the way, according to David Irby, about seven years to take the piece of seaweed and turn them into a good teacher. So, you know, it's, again, it's an indictment of that guy who had the 10 years experience and didn't follow up on it. Well, you know, in the 1950s and 60s, the teaching age were 35 millimeter glass slides, and then they evolved into plastic chrome slides, and these emerged, and the audience sizes were up to a couple of hundred people. Now we have real-time, dispersed knowledge, audiences of 20,000 or more worldwide, and you can put them on the web, and the information is transmitted almost instantaneously around the world. Medical educators today would look back with distress at the rigidity of lectures and labs, the long deferral of patient contact, the absence of problem-based learning, at examinations based upon essays and short written answers, the cautious introduction of a few multiple choice questions. Students were rarely able to ask questions of their teachers 
Women then were a tiny minority in a large class of men. Classes today display a broad diversity of educational experience, ethnic background, and gender. Major changes. So we think that, and I've given you just a few examples, and you have your own in your own institution, in which art can be used as a method of teaching messages, of doing things that we didn't um, think of before, we did in more traditional methods. But I think that the students really do respond to this and that they will in fact incorporate those messages in their lives because of the artwork that they will retain and remember. So we also remember um, Bill Weber because he essentially was a teacher even though he had great influence in this institution and across Canada as an administrator and as a leader, he was essentially a teacher. And so I think he would have enjoyed seeing the kind of images that are used to teach students today. The process of becoming a physician seems to endanger the very trait that leads many young people into medicine. We need to try and teach empathy, but we also need to try and preserve it, and we need to look at the system causes of that. And I really think that this can only be accomplished in a safe and respectful learning environment where teachers role model their own use of empathetic behaviors to advantage. And I think to get to that place where we have that safe and respectful learning environment, what we need is really strong leadership from medical school administrators, teachers, and educators to remind other frontline clinical teachers and also the students and the residents about why we're all here it's to take care of each other and to take care of patients. Competency-based education really focuses on this fundamental issue. I've alluded to it a few times. What are the abilities needed of a graduate? And that's where you're supposed to begin. So the planning cycle for education gets turned on its head. It begins with a practice analysis at any stage and then you define competencies and work backwards through milestones of achievement. If everybody came into this room, and I know this is a bit of sociological jargon way of addressing it, but if everybody came into this room today raced, I didn't say racist, that's a different conversation. If everybody came into this room classed, sexed, gendered, regioned, cultured, and so on, then I think we need to begin not to only think of that in relation to other bodies with whom we deal, but in relation to our own raced, sexed, classed, located bodies. So it's a lot of work to begin to do that self-interrogation. And my suspicion is that in some peculiar way, that's why it's actually absent in the literature, because reflecting and objectifying, if you will, about others is a fairly easy process. Reflecting on our own pedagogy, on our own patient care, on our own development of curriculum, on our own participation in the climate, in our classroom, in clinic, in the hallway, wherever, is much more serious business. If there's a motto for today, at least, it seems to me that if you want your students to be more actively engaged, you have to be more actively passive. Actively passive, intentionally passive, patiently passive, and clearly to f make clear to them why you're being silent or passive. I really enjoy the teaching. I continue to enjoy the teaching, and until they take. Thank you very much.